Because of today's session of the 1956 Democratic National Convention, the following programs will not be seen today. Charles Collingwood and the News. Stand up and be counted. As the World Turns, sponsored by the Procter & Gamble Company. The Johnny Carson Show. Art Link Lettuce House Party, sponsored by the Kellogg Company and Pillsbury Mills. And the Big Payoff. We expect that all of these programs will return tomorrow at their usual times or from any of these same stations. Because of Kennedy's death, probably we don't think a lot about the political campaign that brought him to the presidency at such an early age and really as a somewhat unknown in politics. Yes, his father had been the ambassador to Britain, but that is not really a huge position in American politics, at least, well, it was a little bit in the 19th century. You know, James Buchanan came to the presidency from there, but it's not normally the place where uh, presidents or presidential fathers are coming from. So, politically speaking, Kennedy moved fast, and Kennedy beat his opponents by being early. This happens so many times in politics, but it's not something we necessarily associate with Kennedy what happened? And Tom Oliphant's book, and I, oh, again, highly recommend it, The Road to Camelot Inside JFK's Five-Year Campaign, talks about not the Kennedy in the 1960s, a decade that he only saw three years of, but the 1950s, when he built a lightning-fast political organization that beat everybody out. Uh, one of his opponents that we talked about on that interview, Stuart Symington, great liberal and Truman's favorite for the presidency, came from Missouri way ahead of anybody else, even in the border south on civil rights, and had a lot of labor support and a lot of support within the party. By the time he got to states, even in 1959, the year before the election of 1960, Kennedy's team had already been there, and in some cases already controlled delegates to the state convention. As Oliphant talked about, Kennedy discovered Iowa before Jimmy Carter did, but it's not something commonly talked about. He dominated the Iowa State Convention in 1960. But what's not talked about too much is Kennedy's run for vice president in 1956, and it's an interesting little part of history. It might show up in biographies of Kennedy, but not anywhere else. And in some ways, why should it? After all, you know, it's not... We don't remember Kennedy as a, the nation's greatest candidate for vice president. We remember him as a martyr president. It's where he built his image nationally among the Democratic Party and then with a larger electorate. And it's also another place where Kennedy kind of got there first. The 1956 Democratic Presidential Convention brought to you by Westinghouse from the International Amphitheater in Chicago. Westinghouse, maker of fine appliances for your home. Builder of electrical equipment for all industry. You see, the story of the 1956 convention is that it was going to be a rather dull one. It was going to be in Chicago. Everyone knew that the candidate would be Adelaide Stevenson, the former governor of Illinois. Adelaide Stevenson had gained the nomination in 1952, but he had the misfortune, perhaps, of running against Eisenhower. Probably one of the best candidates ever, a very popular general and somebody that, uh, you know, also had the benefit of a really good television campaign, whereas Adelaide Stevenson was intellectual. But a lot of Democrats respected Adelaide Stevenson for his stick with it 
Nitz and for holding to liberal and intellectual ideas in the midst of a campaign that seemed to be wishy-washy and about the TV and about this general figure of a popular general and his own popularity. And pretty much the party was behind Stevenson in 1956. There were some voices like Harry Truman had some other ideas as to who he might want to see run, but he wasn't as influential in the party anymore. Stevenson had that convention. So the only thing that was going to be of any interest whatsoever was who would be his vice presidential choice. And by 1956, it's pretty common for a candidate to express a preference. But Stevenson does something interesting. He doesn't. Now, there's another side to this story. Before the convention, the Democratic Party had noticed that In the 1952 election, a young senator from Massachusetts had emerged, beating Henry Cabot Lodge, a pretty big win. Young face, telegenic, also a good speaker, and they wanted to give him a prominent role in this natural platform for the Democratic Party. So Kennedy's voice was used to narrate a film about the Democratic Party, and it's the first thing that plays at this convention. It's a great PR move for the Kennedy people. The Pursuit of Happiness, where Kennedy narrating talks about the Democratic Party as being the nation's oldest party and having its roots in Jackson and Jefferson and others. Kennedy's been featured in Newsweek recently, and everyone knows he's a possible, possible pick for vice president. But so is Tennessee Senator Estes Kefar. In fact, he thinks he had it. He was uh, Stevenson's main primary opponent in 1952. In fact, he won the New Hampshire primary and surprised everybody. The man in the coonskin hat led investigations against the mob and brought national prominence to himself in the new medium of television. It could have been the young Kefauver and not Kennedy, perhaps, that we might remember as a president in the 1960s. But it didn't happen. The first is that Stevenson, seeing Kennedy's star power at this convention and in the media, asks this young senator to deliver the nomination speech of his presidential campaign. Stevenson asks him to give the nominating speech. Now, there's a little incident that makes Kennedy nervous during the convention. He's summoned by Eleanor Roosevelt, who sees the kind of attention Kennedy's giving. But Roosevelt, and this will probably continue all the way to 1960, has some questions about Kennedy. It seems like he's not always standing on the issue, and she confronts him directly in a hotel room. Uh, the funny thing is, it's the Blackstone Hotel. And those of you who know American politics and history may know that that's the infamous hotel where the cigar-filled room happened in 1920, and Warren Harding was chosen as the president. <laughs> this was a very different meeting. This wasn't Roosevelt selecting Kennedy for vice president, but trying to overcome her fears. She asked him directly, why did you not stand up against McCarthyism? Kennedy had not been, had not voted when the censure resolution came against Joe McCarthy. She asked why. That was long ago. Kennedy tried to fumble. He gave a rambling account of the Senate procedure, why he wasn't there. Eleanor Roosevelt was not satisfied with the explanation, and Kennedy thought he might be done as any kind of contender for the vice presidential nomination. Yet, Kennedy accepts the job of nominating Stevenson and makes a brilliant speech. And now he's got the movie at the beginning of the convention and this nationally televised speech He's still the star of the convention and possibly irresistible as a VP candidate. Now, there's an issue. Keefe Offer probably would be the normal, uh, the normal circumstances of the VP nominee. But you know, he had run a really strong race in 52. He was a nationally known name. But the big city bosses, Democratic bosses, people like Lyndon Johnson, for instance, didn't like Keefe Offer. They necessarily love Kennedy either, but they didn't like Keefe Offer. So they're unable to come with a consensus of who to recommend to Stevenson, and Stevenson decides he's going to open it up to the convention. Not only is he not satisfied necessarily with the choice of Keefe Hoffer, but he also notes 
how quickly the Republicans in 1956 just picked Eisenhower and Nixon particularly for a second term. He doesn't like Richard Nixon. In fact, in his speech, uh, Kennedy's going to talk about on, on Stevenson's behalf. About how the Republicans have picked two nominees, one Eisenhower who took the high road and one Nixon who took the low road. This is the way Nixon is seen sometimes in the 1950s, kind of like the man doing the bad political work for the good general that everyone respects. And a lot of people felt he should have been dropped from the ticket in 1956. And just to have him easily renominated like that, Stevenson wanted to show a contrast with the Democratic Party being more democratic. So he asked the convention to vote for a vice presidential nominee. Kefauver felt, de- I'll read from uh, Thomas Oliphant's Road to Camelot. Kefauver felt betrayed. He called New York Liberal Party leader Alex Rose, one of his prominent supporters, and told him, I'm packing up and leaving for Chicago with a blast. They double-crossed me. Rose pleaded with him not to do anything intemperate, then hurried to Kefauver's suite, where others were counseling him to stay and make a run for the second place on the ticket. At least talk to Adelaide before you leave town. Kefauver agreed to accompany Roper to a private visit with Stevenson. Mollified by their conversation, he then agreed to have his name put in nomination, and forces began an all-night effort to track down delegates who had supported his presidential campaign. However, his own state, the Tennessee delegation, refuses to endorse Kefauver. He was so unpopular with most Tennesseans, they intended to vote for Al Gore. This is Al Gore's father, Tennessee Senator Albert Gore Sr., who runs as a favorite son candidate and gets all 32 of the state's votes. It also annoys Hubert Humphrey, who thought he was getting the nod, too. Sure that he would be chosen, Humphrey was actually writing his acceptance speech when he heard of Stevenson's decision. He and his team also scurried to round up delegates. Now, an interesting thing occurs about the 1956 decision of Kennedy to end, to put his name in for a nominee for vice president. His father, Joseph Kennedy Sr., does not like this decision. So, so often you hear that the Kennedys, the influence in, uh, that the, the elder Kennedys, the influence in politics for them? Well, not in this case. One of the things that Oliphant writes is that Robert Kennedy winced on a phone call as his father unleashed with what Kenny O'Donnell described as blue language. He called Jack Kennedy an idiot and predicted that he was destroying his political career. But Robert Kennedy and Jack Kennedy didn't feel this way. In fact, their aide Ted Sorensen had data that showed that a Catholic vice presidential candidate could help the ticket in as many as 14 states where there were large populations. There's something else to keep in mind about 1956, and Oliphant writes it here. This was the first convention to have a wide television audience. Now, the other conventions, even 1948, had been televised. But not everybody had the sets. This is 1956. Coverage was gavel to gavel, so cameras were on hand to capture all of the excitement. The unfolding scene was described the next day in the New York Times by Russell Baker as a spectacle that might have confounded all Christendom in the old days. Given space to watch the proceedings on television in the Stockyard Inn, a few steps from the convention hall, Kennedy huddled inside room 104 with Saracen and a political... and a. Ch- and a Chicago plainclothes officer assigned as a guard as companions. Chair does not have the remainder of the Missouri vote yet. And one vote for Senator Hubert Humphrey. This is one of our polling delegations. We want to close the balance. We want to close the balance in here. Well, Kennedy has support from a surprising place. He's from Massachusetts, and he's obviously getting that delegation. He's getting some support in New York, other northern states, but he's getting almost unanimous support from the South. South aren't happy with Kefauver. So this is largely an anti-Kefauver vote. 
First roll call comes in. No one gets anywhere near the 687 needed to win the nomination. Keefe offer 483, Kennedy 302. Oliphant writes again, Humphrey had watched the first call wrote the first roll call vote with dismay. He already felt deceived by Stevenson. Now he was rejected by 90% of the delegates. He knew political jackals would be coming to ask him to give his votes to another. Never a man to hide his emotions. He began to cry softly. Comes in second in the second ballot as well. Nobody with a majority. Then as the time that you get to the third roll call, something changes. Carmen DeSapio, who is the uh, head of Tammany Hall at this point in 1956, boss of New York. New York gives one and a half votes for Keefe Offer, 96 and a half votes for the next vice president of the United States, John Kennedy. When it comes to Texas, the majority leader, Lyndon Johnson, says Texas proudly cast its 56 votes for the fighting sailor who wears the scars of battle, that fearless senator, the next vice president of the United States, John Kennedy of Massachusetts. Third ballot goes with Kennedy in a lead, 613 to 551. Then Kentucky switches. 30 votes from Gore go to Kennedy. And he has 643 and a half votes, 43 from winning. That's how close John F. Kennedy came to being a vice presidential candidate, and by his own account, possibly the end of his career. And it's really a last-minute switch for Kefauver that does Kennedy in. One of the issues is that Kefauver was mostly being opposed the, by Senator Gore, who was also from Tennessee, and a mutual friend of theirs the publisher of a big newspaper in Nashville, by the time you get to the third ballot, goes to Gore and says, my paper has supported you throughout your career. I'm supporting Keefe Offer. I need you to drop out of the race. Gore does. The votes go to Keefe Offer, and he narrowly beats Kennedy for the vice presidential nomination. Kennedy rises up, asks the presiding officer, Sam Reburn, Speaker of the House, if he can speak. Mr. Chairman, I move that we suspend the rules and make the nomination of Estes T. Botha by acclamation. It's a magnanimous speech, and he will go on and campaign for Stevenson in the 1956 election. He'll be rewarded with thank yous from all sorts of officials across the land, and still don't think most people were thinking he'd be the presidential nominee in 1960. He probably was at that time their thought for the a vice presidential ticket in the future. So it's a little known fact of the 1956 vice presidential run of JFK that kind of got everything started. And that and the fact that Lyndon Johnson just seemed lethargic and not able to run a presidential campaign. And Robert Caro talked about it. And Thomas Oliphant and I talked about some of the reasons there. He just didn't want to, was afraid kind of to do something that he might lose. Wasn't his thing. Kennedy was so fast moving that he would use the rest of the years in the 1950s to dominate the Democratic Party, and to win the primaries for president, while other opponents thought that their national prominence or their connections with party bosses would get them the nomination. Well, thanks for listening, and thank you for subscribing to the podcast.